episode 17. It's interesting, this particular uh, episode, which is called The Honor of England, is, was originally, I think, slated to be like number six or seven in my series, and I'm number 17 when I'm getting to it, which if that gives you any insight into how many messages have cropped out of my meditations and have led to a very slow start. I, I think uh, I was talking in the back before I came up that you know I've been doing this series for over a month, and yet this message, as far as where it flows in the, uh, the chronology of World War I, is about a month into it. So technically, it's taken me longer to go through Daily Thunder uh, than it did the war itself to unfold. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that bodes well, if, if it was a... If it was a four-year war, you could just imagine how many years. It probably translates to somewhere around six and a half uh, years of Daily Thunder. So I am planning on fast-forwarding because there's a lot of blood in war, and you'll notice that I haven't talked about it much. And I think we were joking once that there hasn't even been a bullet uh, that you've heard fired in all of the engagement yet. I mean, we did have some bomb blasts go off. Uh, Big Bertha you know, shot up some artillery shells. But, uh, and then someone did bring up the fact that Gavrilo Princip did shoot a bullet into Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, which did start the war. So, uh, but my fascination with war isn't bullets, artillery, bomb blasts. It isn't uh, blood and gore. There's a lot of that in World War I. It is a terrible landscape, and it is very challenging as a man to actually uh, confront it and just put yourself in it. You know, because in our country, we have something called conscientious objection, where in accordance with your conscience, you can actually make an appeal to, uh, to avoid the draft. Now, historically, those people that object even of, with conscience still oftentimes will volunteer to participate to help their country. I mean, they're, they're a part of a country, so how can I serve my country? Uh, but there's other countries like Germany, like uh, Russia in this, that don't have that option on the table. And, uh, and so there is a, uh, it, when you're under the control of, like especially in World War II, it's very hard for me to swallow. When you're under the control of, a, of an evil power and you have no choice, it's either you fight or you die. And you just think about that with your family. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to choose to die, be shot, uh, because I refuse to go to war, now I'm going to leave my wife and my kids without a father or a husband because I refuse to fight. Should I just fight? And should I just not shoot the gun? You know, <laughs> you could just imagine what these men went through in that time. It's extremely challenging for the conscience uh, to go through. And so some of the things that were walked through in the last couple years in our country I think are good to start exercising the conscience and just start to say, okay, where do I land on that? Instead of just absorbing what everyone else in cultural correctness is saying, it's like, okay, I want to make a stand and say, Lord, what is my position in these things? I think it's a very, very good thing to walk through. We'll call it a warm-up. I call this the honor of England. Uh, It probably is better called the call to action, but since I've had this title for so long, and there's a reason for it, and it's even like a personal reason, because the book, The Guns of August, that I've been using, it all came out of me prepping for this message a long time ago. So this message has been in the hopper for a long time, it just keeps getting pushed out, and uh, it all started with this one comment in a podcast where it said, where the, the podcast guy said, and Barbara Tuckman describes uh, John French as having a tear streaming down his face. And so I was like, okay, where do I get that quote? I wanna find out about that because that adds an extra layer to the story that I was gonna give. And then I went on this vast search for, couldn't find it anywhere on the internet. And so I decided to just buy Barbara Tuckman's book and then scour it for this one quote. Sure enough, I find it way, way in the end of the book too. So it's, it was quite the process, but I discovered a book and that had a huge impact on my series so far. And that's The Guns of August. It is a stirring book. I mean, she is a magnificent writer, but it, it brings you into it in a very unique way. So there is a line that is said that is about the honor of England in that. And so the book that started, or I'm sorry, the 
the message that started my, my pursuit, I actually stumbled across the guns of August, is this one. So I'll give that quote, and you realize how many other quotes have come out of it, uh, too. Part 17, The Honor of England. So this is going to be sort of a story where we put ourselves into it. I do this every now and then in the process where I sort of identify us with a character in the story. And we're going to be Sir John French. I don't know if you guys remember Sir John French. Uh, he's the uh, sort of like the commander-in-chief, the field marshal of the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force. And he's not doing very well right now. He's a little unstable, and uh, he's a very powerful man in this story. So, you know, that could be a compliment to you. However, I'm also identifying with us with sort of the unstable character in the group because he's going to be called upon for an action. And it's not altogether different than what we're going through this week in the Alumni Summit. We're being called to action. And so I think identifying with John French is, is really good in this. But this is September 5th, 1914, which if you know the, the flow of World War I, which we've been going through, we've been building up towards this, we're heading into something called the Battle of the Marne, a very, very significant turning point in World War I. So there's Sir John French. Uh, it seems like, uh, I was actually thinking I should probably do a, must uh, a mustache. I should probably do a, a message about mustaches. <laughs> And uh, I, I was encouraged to maybe grow a mustache myself. Could you imagine, I grow a, I grow a mustache and then I do a, a message on mustaches. That would be profound. Uh, or I could just wear one. I could you know, paste one on for one of my daily thunder messages. Uh, but we're gonna call Sir John French the hesitant soul. And I think every one of us can identify at a certain level. You know, there, there's certain things where you could ask us to do hard things and we, there's certain areas of our life we'd be like, I'm ready to do that. And then there's other areas where we're just sort of hoping no one ever asks us to do anything in that zone. And you know, like for me, for me, I get asked to do things a lot which are very uncomfortable for most people, and that's to speak off the cuff in front of a large audience. I get those privileges a lot. And I, in a strange way, relish the challenge of it. I still have the awkwardness, and I feel it. However, I relish the fact that I know God will give me words. And so in a strange sense, I'm proven in that area. And as a result, I don't panic over it. I'm not hesitant. I'm like, okay, absolutely. But there's a lot of other areas where, and I, I've oftentimes joked about the, the other areas, which my, my best description is the standing up in the middle of Starbucks and just starting to preach. That one is a little more challenging for you. Like, Eric, you preach all the time. What's the difference? I, I just, it's just a little different, just a little different. And it's not that I, you know, it's, there's an unwillingness, it's in hes a hesitancy, if that makes sense. It's like, well, that doesn't fit my, my groove, my, you know, my, my image. My image doesn't really fit that. And, you know, there's all sorts of reasons we could have. And, you know, I don't want to offend people that I'm trying to reach with the gospel. Well, you could reach them this way with the gospel, Eric. Yeah, I mean, oh, but that's just not my style. I, I prefer to do different things. And that's where you see in this message... You're going to see a guy being challenged to do something that's going to move him in a very uncomfortable direction. So here's another guy, Henry Wilson. You've actually heard a quote from Henry Wilson because it was in the last message. However, you probably don't know much about him. And he is going to be one of the key guys under French, one of the key advisors uh, over in France at the time. And I'm going to call him the interpreter. You see, Sir John French, who's the leader of the BEF, the British forces, even though his last name is French, and ironically, he cannot stand the French. And then you have Henry Wilson, who is like the happy-go-lucky guy. He's the, uh, ever the optimist, big, tall, lanky guy, and he loves the French. In fact, you sort of get the thought that maybe he likes France more than he likes Great Britain. Uh, because he, anything the French are doing is like, that's a good idea. Meanwhile, John French is like, it's a French idea, it's a bad idea. You know, it's the exact opposite. So these two are, are a really funny combination. I'm going to call him the interpreter, and that will make sense as we go forward. Joseph Joffre is what I'm going to call the call to action. So he's, just as John French is the leader of the British Expeditionary Force, the leader of their military movements, Joseph Joffre is over the French military movements. So he's the big dog, and he has a cool mustache as well. Uh, but he's going to be the call to action. He's going to be the one in France who's carrying a burden. 
And it's a very intense burden. You see, we need to move into an offensive position to strike the Germans while their flank is exposed. Now, if you listen to the last message, you, that would make sense. If you didn't listen to the last message, well, you know what? That's an encouragement to listen to the last message. So here's a picture. It's sort of fun seeing a picture like this. Now, I'm going to circle. You see, the blue circle is over John French. He's a shorter guy, and that's the guy that doesn't like the French. He's over the British Armed Forces. The big, huge guy with the red circle around his head, that's Joseph Joffre. And then back in the back with the green circle is Henry Wilson, okay, tall, lanky uh, guy. Uh, but I'm going to introduce a third character, I'm sorry, a fourth character into this storyline, and that's Sir Archibald Murray. So he's going to be British, and he is also an advisor to Sir John French, and he's going to be the exact opposite of uh, Henry Wilson. Henry Wilson is like, we got him. We can do this. The French want to do this. We should do what the French want. And then you have this guy, Sir Archibald Murray, who wants to get off the island, who wants to get off of France back to the island. He wants to leave this. The, the French cannot be trusted. The Germans are, have already won this thing. You see, he's been burned multiple times in this process so far by the French, and his troops have been massively harmed, and this was not what they expected, and his experience is very, very loud. And so as a result, he's the damper pedal. So Sir John French doesn't need that right now. You know, he's already, you know, down in the dumps to start with, and he's disturbed, and he's sort of panicky. He doesn't need this, and neither do we. We don't need a Sir Archibald uh, Miller in our life either. Have you ever noticed that there is a voice called experience? I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about fact, faith, and experience before. However, there's that other voice that wants to beckon you away from the clear call. And there's so many reasons why, and there's so many emotions attached to the clear movement forward. Some of you, as you've been here this week, have been stirred towards an action. And yet there's, it's funny because you want to, there's a part of you that's, it's like Henry Wilson. It's like, no, this is a great idea. Let's do it. And then there's another part of you that's very similar to Archibald Miller, that's just like, ah, oh, boy, this could happen. This, I mean, it could get even worse than this. I mean, what are you going to do about this? It's a pessimist all through. So Sir John French, which we're calling the hesitant soul, this is a quote from Barbara Tuckman. Sir John French, succumbing to the belief that the danger was mortal, had determined that the BEF must be preserved from being involved in a French defeat. He has decided that he wants to withdraw his troops from this engagement. Okay, that was happening right, you know, in the last couple messages where Sir John is beginning to go on meltdown. Now, something that we didn't go into, which could be a message in and of itself, is Lord Kitchener, if you remember that guy. That guy's the, he's, he's on all the posters for the, the British saying, we want you. Uh, just like we have Uncle Sam, they had Lord Horatio Kitchener on theirs. He has a big bushy mustache too, and with his finger pointing at all the men of the country saying, we want you. He's the one that's, oh, he's like the war minister. And so he's technically like over John French, but there's a, uh, there's a, a delicate balance between the military arm and the governmental arm and how they work together. And so he's actually going to come over to France and he's basically going to tell Sir John French, you are not retreating. You're going to stand your ground. And so Sir John French isn't so sure about that. There, there's, a, there's a lot going on here right now. But Sir John French is not in a healthy place. Sir Archibald Murray, which we're calling the bitter experience, this is what Barbara Tuckman said about him. Usually calm, balanced, and reflective, the opposite of his chief, who is uh, John French, Murray would have been an excellent compliment for Sir John in an aggressive mood, but as he was by nature cautious and pessimistic, he acted as a stimulus to Sir John's gloom. So yeah, that's what our experience can be. Our experience can actually work as a stimulus to our gloom as opposed to the one that's cheering us on to be a good general. You see, in a strange sense, you have an army, you have a life, you have equipment, you have resource that has been entrusted to you. It's just like this human body. If you are uh, you know, a husband, you actually have a marriage, or if you're a wife, you have a husband and you have a marriage. You have this, this strength, and then if you have children, you have something. It's like arrows in the hands of a, a mighty man. In other words, you have this military equipment just like John French has but he is leaning towards using it for himself 
to saying, well, you know what? This could be better used for another day. Isn't that funny? That, that's going to come up multiple times in World War I from the British side. It's like, why would we waste this? This could be used for another day. Well, what's the military for? It's for the day, and this is the day. And, and we're going to have another entire event that's going to happen in the future in World War I called Gallipoli. And Winston Churchill is over the Navy at this time. He's the a naval minister, and he wants to send out their old ships that are good for nothing but being broken into parts. And the, uh, the admirals, admiral, admirals love these old ships. This is what they've swabbed the deck for so many years. They've fallen in love with them. And Winston Churchill's like, what are they built for in the first place? What, we love them. Let's spend them. This is the time they are called upon. And the same is true for us. We have a tendency to swab our deck. We love our life. We love it just the way it is. And then when God asks for it, which we've always told them, yes, the reason you built me was to spend me. I mean, we've talked with him about this, long conversations with him about this. But then when he asks for it, we have a tendency to be in a very Sir John Frenchish mood where we have our reasons, and Sir Archibald Miller is over there going, yeah, you, know, you don't really want to spend your life in this. I mean, to die over here. I mean, the French, how do we know that they're going to follow through on their word? I mean, look at the experiment, experience we've had from the Battle of Mons all the way down to the Great Retreat. I, I want out of here. And me meanwhile, Henry Miller's like, come on, give him another chance. Let's go. The French, this is what we're here for. This is why we exist as a military. This is what we've trained for right here, right now. So Henry Wilson, who I'm calling the interpreter, this is Barbara Tuckman saying, Henry Wilson said to Colonel Huguet, I don't know how to pronounce that, by the way, if you're wondering, and you're like, I think he butchered that. I think I did too. <laughs> but this is what Henry Wilson said. The Germans are over hasty. They urge the pursuit too fast. The whole thing is overdone. They are bound to make a big mistake, and then your hour will come. You see, he's He's leaning French in this. He wants to fight this battle. He knows the Germans are thin in their line. He can see it. He can taste it. Now, what's interesting is Henry Wilson, up to this point, has been massively over-optimistic. And there's reasons why Sir John French doesn't necessarily want to listen to his counsel. Because he was when, when the reports were coming back that there are these massive divisions of Germans coming down from the north in the sledgehammer, He's like, no, those are all overstated. They wouldn't ever do that. And so everything in this has always been, whatever the French think, Henry Wilson thinks. And so he keeps giving them that feedback, and it turned out to be wrong. So you can understand why Sir Archibald Miller is looking at uh, Henry, Henry Wilson's optimism with a little jaundiced eye. And the same thing can happen in our life where we can move forward with great guns and great strength and get burned in the process. And now the tendency is to hold back. And it's like, God, I want to serve you radically. I've dealt with that in regards to orphan care. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon that I've noticed inside of me. There is one point in my life where you could probably measure me and say, Eric may be one of the most on fire guys for helping orphans on earth. Right now, if you just were to stop, take a photo of that moment. The heat was very strong. And it's not that I don't care about it now, I care about it deeply. However, I, I would say that I would acknowledge my heat has lessened, but why? Because Eric has gone through the ringer. I had a battle of Mons and a great retreat. I got hit and hit hard on the front lines of orphan care. And that's a long story, right? However, when you go through the Battle of Mons and the Great Retreat and you're running for your life, well, you don't really desire to turn around and go on the attack again. And so you have to reposition. And God seems to know that, too, with our souls, that there's a restorative period where what the locust is eaten, he wants to restore. And when he restores, it's sort of like the principle of pruning. The enemy eats away at the vine, and then God's recalls it something. Instead of it being devoured, he says that was pruned. And when a vine is pruned, what's going to happen to it? It's going to even bear more fruit. And I've seen that in multiple areas of my life too, where there are certain things that I have felt very strongly about that I'll go through a bitter experience. And yet when I bring it back to God, there is a restoration process that can take place and my passion in that area can actually amplify 
as opposed to just try and crawl back to where it was, it could actually amplify. So here's Joseph Joffre. He's a fascinating study in and of itself. I actually originally had an entire message on Joseph Joffre, and I've never given it, so I've just sort of hinted at him from the outside. But a really interesting character, but I'm calling him the call to action. He's the one that's carrying our burden right now. Here's a quick description of him. Joffre was massive and paunchy in his baggy uniform. Wouldn't you like to be described that way in history? With a fleshy face adorned by a heavy, nearly white mustache and bushy eyebrows to match. With a clear, youthful skin, calm blue eyes, and a candid, tranquil gaze, Joffre looked like Santa Claus and gave an impression of benevolence and naivety, two qualities not noticeably part of his character. <laughs> he is one very intense man, and he means business. This guy is, I mean, you don't want to get on his bad side. He'll give you the cold shoulder very quickly as a general. If you don't do exactly as he asks, or you make a comment, or you question him in a meeting, he'll just turn his back on you, or his shoulder towards you, and not acknowledge that you exist the rest of the meeting. He controls, he manipulates, he's a very fascinating character. There's, there's qualities of this guy that I would say like all of us want, but there's about a whole bunch of them that we don't want, okay? So in other words, he is a real flawed character with some fascinating quality. And the, the, the fascinating quality that has most entranced people since World War I and the French people that still would look at him as a hero is that he is unshakable and unmovable. The, the worse it gets in the world, the more calm and confident he gets. It's like the reverse effect. Most people, like the worse it gets, they, the more uh, trembly and anxious they get. It's the exact opposite effect on him. The worse it gets, the taller he becomes. And the nation is like clinging to his confidence in this time because he's totally confident. We got the Germans right where we want them. And yet everyone else in France and in Great Britain is like, we've lost. And meanwhile, there's one guy in the landscape that is saying, we can win this. And that's exactly what France and Great Britain needed at this exact moment. So I'm calling it the burden of France. Joffre desires to share it with Great Britain. With Great Britain. So now I've tried to explain up to this point, and if you've only gotten pieces of all of this, I don't know what it's like being in your shoes, because I understand it all, right? And so it's translating what's inside of Eric into a message, which isn't always the easiest, but the Germans are coming down from the north, but not just from the north, they're coming from the east, and they're, they're swinging around to even look at it, potential double encirclement. And Paris is, has been their goal. At the very last minute, von Kluck is going to swing to the left, his movement, to brush his sleeve against Paris, but he's trying to encircle the French, and it's just a quicker way to end the war in his mind. And yet what he's going to do when he does that, he's going to open up his flank, the side of his army, which is the vulnerable side. And every, it's called outflanking your enemy. That's your goal. And, but you never want to outflank yourself. In other words, turn your flank when your enemy's over here. But von Kluck doesn't believe that there's any strength here to hit him. He thinks John French is gone. He thinks Manoree's army is decimated and defeated. And he believes that uh, Gallienne's support and defense of uh, the capital city of Paris is merely a defensive army alone. They would never go on the attack. And so he is going to turn and expose his flank, and this is the exact moment we're in. And Joffre is going to find out about this. Now he has a burden. He either loses his country or he attacks. And he has to attack now. But if he's going to do this, he needs more than Manoree's army. He needs Sir John French to catch the vision. Sir John French is the least likely guy on earth at this exact moment to catch this vision. And that's what makes this moment so amazing. Okay, because I mean, some of us could say that we're the least likely in here to be called to, you know, the Middle East. Okay, that's a scary thing to bring up because some of you are like, oh yeah, that, what, what are you saying, Eric? <laughs> Does that mean I'm going to be called to the Middle East? In other words, you, may, you could lay out all sorts of different things and say, I'm the least likely person for this. Well, be watchful when you start you know, making statements like that because the Spirit of God is first, not just looking to send you to the Middle East. He's looking to make you ready, ready to join into his burden. 
So Barbara Tuckman says it this way, on the morning of September 5th, Joffre's uncertainty about British intentions became altogether agonizing. So he had sent emissaries over there, and Sir John French won't even talk with them. And so finally, Joffre is going to actually, he had a, a race car driver that actually uh, would take him around. Uh, so it was like this professional race car driver, which was his driver. And he would go around to all the different spots. And uh, so he is so, he's in an agony. It's an interesting uh, statement that Joffre, who is imperturbable, never shows any emotion, is in an agony because he wants to know what Sir John French is going to do. But Sir John French is not giving him an answer. I need to know. So I'm going to liken this, what Joffre is carrying is the burden of the Lord. Now, the burden of France and the burden of the Lord are very, two very different things. I don't want us to mix them up, but sometimes a picture really helps us. And the, there is a burden that our Lord has that he desires to share. Now, that's a premise that I want to actually go into Scripture with, but I am a firm believer that God's burden is not meant for God alone, but that the, one of the reasons he has brought us into fellowship is so that we could be an extension of his hands, of his feet, of his eyes, of his mouth, of his heart. And that heart is carrying a burden, a grief, a longing. And he is looking for someone who will participate. He's turning to John French, who is us in this story, and he's entreating us to say, will you understand my burden? And will you participate in what I desire to do in this earth. So, so I'm saying God desires to share it with us, which is a profound statement. So let's look at Jeremiah 27 through 9. I'm going to look at Jeremiah, and then we're also going to look at Ezekiel. There's a lot of evidence of this in Scripture, but these two illustrations are really powerful. So this is Jeremiah talking. Oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Now this poor guy, Jeremiah, is having a rough go of it, okay? He's in derision daily. Why? Well, long and short, it's because he's carrying the word of the Lord. And when he speaks the word of the Lord, nothing goes well for him. So he says, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted, violence and plunder. Because of the word of the Lord, because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, so this is Jeremiah's conclusion. Listen to this. He said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. You ever had sort of a thought like that? John French is choosing to leave town. Okay, I'm done fighting with the French. You know, all this has done is caused harm to my, to my military arm. It's like, no, we're going to preserve ourselves. That's exactly what Jeremiah is thinking. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. In other words, we can even have those John French moments where we turn and we reject the French. We're like, no, I am no longer fighting alongside of them. And then there's a burning in our bones, and we're compelled. You see, God, there is, there is going to be this way that God works in his saints, to win us to his side. Even though we're being in derision every day and being mocked, I mean, who wants to stand with that? And yet there is something greater that is working on us. So here's Ezekiel 2, 8 through 10. So God is gonna come to Ezekiel. This is during the, cap the Babylonian captivity and everything is in ruins in Israel. And God wants to find a man that he can share his burden with. And so multiple times, he's actually gonna pick uh, him up by a lock of the hair uh, and show him. He's like, what do you see, Ezekiel? And I mean, he's going to shout into his ear with a loud voice. It's, it's almost like you, you, you picture God going, Ezekiel, do you see what I see? What is going on inside of you when you see that? Because what I want to go on inside of you is what's going on inside of me. And so he's going to say, open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, if God came to you and said that, what, what's your first instinct? Uh, what is it that you're going to give me? Because yeah, I really don't, I don't digest cauliflower very well. <laughs> Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Oh, uh, I mean, not many of us will just eat anything that's set in front of us. I mean, there's a few of us in here that will. It's like, oh yeah, stick it there. And I love novelty food. 
Well, I'm the exact opposite. I'm the guy that I go to a restaurant, I get the same thing every single time. Okay, I like the predictable experiment experience. Uh, I don't like the experiment. Uh, and so when I was traveling, someone had heard, I, I'd given a missionary message of when you're a missionary, you eat what's said in front of you. It's part of your respect thing. And this one group over in Indonesia had heard that message. So they stuck some things in front of me. Uh, you know, and they're all laughing off to the side, right? It's like, oh, no. <clears throat> Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Would you eat this? Eat what I give you. And it's like a scroll. It's the word of God, right? But it's, it's covered with lamentations, mourning, and woe. I don't, I don't want that. I would, I would prefer something different that doesn't uh, sit well in my stomach. And yet God wants to share it with us. You see, he has lamentations, mourning, and woe. And he wants us to carry it with him. Ezekiel 8, 1 through 6. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness, like a, the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward fire, and from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair. Uh, that's pleasant. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there north of the altar gate was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. I don't want to see that. I don't want... Lamentations, mourning, and woe. I don't want to be held in derision and mocked. And yet, God wants to share a burden. And what in this message of World War I we're calling the burden of France that Joffre is carrying, his nation is hanging in the balance. He's like, John French, do you see this? Do you see this? We're lost. And for whatever reason, I mean, John French, or I'm sorry, Joseph Joffre isn't that excited about having to lean on John French any more than John French is interested in helping Joseph Joffre. The two don't get along very well, right? And yet, for us, obviously, it's a different thing. We love Jesus. We care about Jesus, but we're also very interested in self and self-preservation. And there is a part of us that speaks very loudly in moments like this, especially when we have bitter experience. And we're afraid of touching that, you know, if you've been bitten by, uh, you know, the hot iron, you don't really want to get near it again, because the last time you tried to pick it up, it burned you. And so you have a tendency to be hesitant. And that is the same way John French is in this situation, but that's the same way many of us can be in regards to radical givenness. I had a season where I decided I was going to go after a, a very specific list in prayer, uh, and I was going to do it every day, multiple times a day, until I saw the breakthrough in these exact points. I don't remember how many it was, like four different things. And the counterattack that came against me and the difficulties I faced in direct contrast to that were such that I found myself, you know, a few months later looking back and going, why did I give that up? But it's interesting because I could explain it to you on the human level, and you would understand you'd nod along, but on the spiritual level, there was a very clear letting go. There was a very clear loss of priority to save my skin. And God had to walk me through a correction in that, that to carry his burden means lamentation, mourning, and woe. It means derision. It does mean mockery. It does mean being grabbed by the lock of your hair every now and then and seeing the abominations and grieving at a level that everyone else seems immune to. No one else seems to care. Why do you need to care? God, could you just let me stick my head in the sand? No, he can't. 
The time is now, but will Sir John French listen? There is like moments to make a decision here. Von Kluck's flank is available now. Maybe not, you know, in the future. In other words, it's, it's right now. This is the moment of history. Now, what's interesting is, you know, I'm going to say the same here. The time is now, but will you and I listen? You see, when the enemy exposes a flank, when there's an opening, like has been classically understood after World War II when Japan was devastated, that many Christians in history have said there was an opening, but the Christians, or not many Christians, actually walked through it. They were destitute. They did not have a faith system. They didn't have anything to rally around, and as a result, there was a vacuum created. The time is now, is basically what the Spirit of God is saying. The flank is opened. Go! And for us to be on call and ready is of the utmost importance. Today you may not be sent out to Japan, but tomorrow you may be. Today is the day of readying our soul and agreeing with the burning in our bones to say, yes, Lord, my hands are open to what you desire. I want my life to be malleable for your purposes. That doesn't always mean going somewhere. That might mean going up to someone and speaking. That might mean an action in your life that is very tactical, that the Spirit of God is readying you for, that is not easy. Joseph Joffre says, if I could give orders to the English army as I could to the French army in the same position, I would pass immediately to the attack. He had absolutely dictatorial authority amongst the military men of France. And he can say exactly where they're going to be and what they're going to do. But guess what? The British, he doesn't have that. Well, that's frustrating. You know, and it's interesting. That's the reason I put that quote up there is God doesn't force us to do anything. In other words, it's a similar type of relationship where he entreats us, and he does know how to stick a burning in our bones, by the way, and he is greater than us, and he's very good at convincing us and bringing us to his conclusion. However, we're sort of like John French, where we're like, I don't know that you have direct authority over me. He does, but we need to accept the fact that the burden of France is actually what we were called to this country to participate in. Why is the British Expeditionary Force in France right now? It's because of the burden of France. And they are supposed to stand in agreement with the French. That's what's already been established. So Sir John French wants to come up with his excuses, but they don't really stand. Barbara Tuckman says it this way, assuming that the German armies were everywhere advancing victoriously along the whole front, it was the Germans' habit to believe their own communiques. He, meaning von Kluck, did not think the enemy could have forces available to threaten his flank. So the enemy is moving happily along, just about to sort of swallow up and sweep up and mop up the remaining remnants of the British and the French, and to close off this war. Medals are already being distributed by the Kaiser. Victory is in hand, and no one on the German side, believes that Manory, Gallieni, and French have the power or the will to do anything to their flank. Order number six is what it's called. That's what uh, Joseph Joffre is going to uh, commission, and I'm going to call it the burden of France. That's what it is. Order number six is the burden of France. Different languages, different priorities, but sharing the immense burden. To get Britain, Great Britain and France together on anything is supernatural. Okay, these guys have been ancient foes. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting because at the very beginning of this series, I gave a message. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I think it was the insecurity of William, which goes back to 1909 when uh, there was the death of uh, the king of England. And this, this previous king actually went out of his way to build a relationship with France. And the reason that we're even in a situation right now where France and Great Britain can even be on the same continent considering fighting next to each other is because of this king's work. It's, it's pretty profound, okay? That's, that's a different message, different time. Barbara Tuckman says this. The field marshal was standing at a table waiting for him flanked by Murray. So here's our big event, guys. This is the whole reason I went after this book in the first place, was this scene. 
The field marshal, so that's John French, was standing at a table waiting for Joseph Joffre, flanked by Murray. Uh, you guys remember Sir Archibald Murray? And Wilson, and Huguet is like a, and I can't say his name correctly, right? But he's like a French emissary, looking as usual as he, you looking as usual as if he had lost his last friend. Uh, John French is a dour character. He's always sort of in a grumpy mood and, and downcast, all the more so right now. He thinks the world is against him. And several other members of his staff, Joffre, walked over and for once took the floor at the outset. Instead of his usual laconic sentences, he was a man of very, very, very few words. That's what laconic would mean, almost like silent. Doesn't say anything and then you might make a couple sentences. Instead of his usual laconic sentences, a passionate flood of speech poured forth, punctuated by a gesture of his forearms, which seemed to throw his heart on the table. He said the supreme moment had arrived. His own orders were given, and whatever happened, the last company of the French army would be thrown into the battle to save France. The lives of all French people, the soil of France, the future of Europe depended upon the offensive. I cannot believe the British army will refuse to do its share in this supreme crisis. History would severely judge your absence. Joffre's fist crashed down on the table. Now, I wish I could say this French style, okay, because it's a cool statement. It basically means like field marshal. But monsieur le maracol, okay? <laughs> If I, if I sort of twist my mustache as I do it, it sounds French. I don't know how to speak French. So he's, say, he's saying this to uh, John French. The honor of England is at stake. At these words, Sir John French, who had been listening with passionate attention, suddenly reddened. Silence fell in the company. Slowly, tears came into the eyes of the British commander-in-chief and rolled down his cheeks. He struggled to say something in French and gave up. And then he said something that I didn't want to stick on the screen. And he was trying to talk with Henry Wilson, who was the interpreter. So Henry Wilson is like wanting to get these two together, right? So this is a key moment. And, he, and John French is basically going to say, I can't explain it. Tell him, tell him we'll do all we possibly can. Joffre looked inquiringly at Wilson, who translated, the field marshal says yes. <laughs> it was hardly needed, for the tears in the tone already carried conviction. Murray hurriedly put in that the British troops were now, this is Murray adding his two cents to it, Murray hurriedly put in that the British troops were now 10 miles farther back than the positions called for in the order, and could only start at 9 a.m., not 6, as Joffre asked. It was a voice of caution that would continue to make itself felt. Joffre shrugged, it cannot be helped. I have the field marshal's word, that is enough tea was then served. <laughs> I've always thought that is one of the most hilarious lines. In the midst of this drama, that line, and that's classic Joffre too, he would never miss a meal. He would always say, hey, it's time for tea. In the middle of a crisis, like it's time to eat. Uh, so, I mean, that fits it so well. Tea was then served. The Battle of the Marne, order number six in action. So, this is zooming in on our map that we've had. We're at France. Great Britain is going to be up to uh, the northwest. Uh, Germany is the red block to the upper northeast. And that star uh, is Paris. And that dotted line is von Kluck's uh, army, the first army that is coming down and was supposed to take Paris. But to the French and to the British, for some inexplicable reason, is turning. Paris is totally vulnerable. Paris's defenses are not set up yet. They could swallow it up, take over this incredibly important city on earth, and without even hardly anything but a fly swatter. And yet they're going to turn and instead expose their flank. I mean, this is just a remarkable moment. So the things that uh, are being underestimated is Sir John French is one of those blue dots. Uh, Gallieni uh, is in Paris, who's a, like a wily general, and this wily general has Mannery's army. And so as a result, you take those three together and you have yourself a very, very dangerous attack against that flank. And so that's just the Battle of the Marne right there. Uh, it's showing those blue dots, even though I guarantee you 
th this is not accurate to size. Neither is Paris as big as that star, right? But just to give you an idea of how that's working, they're going to hit that weakened side that is spread out too thin, and they're going to shock the Germans. Joseph Joffre, this is the order he read to his troops on September 6, 1914. Now as the battle is joined on with which the safety of the country depends, everyone must be reminded that this is no longer the time for looking back. Every effort must be made to attack and throw back the enemy. A unit which finds it impossible to advance must, regardless of cost, hold its ground and be killed on the spot rather than fall back. In the present circumstances, no failure will be tolerated. Now, that's a pretty heavy-handed leadership, but I like the intensity of it. I like the urgency of it. Its urgency is something that we lack in the church today. We see a dying world. We know the world is dying, but it's not as urgent as that. You know, 150,000 people estimated die and go to hell every day. And, but it's not as urgent as that because my rights are not being impinged. When that starts happening, we start waking up. When it comes into our backyard, suddenly it becomes urgent. And yet, what if it's in God's backyard? Is it urgent if it's in God's children's backyard, even if it's not in yours? In other words, could we allow God's heart to define urgency instead of ours? Instead of allowing John French to make the decision here, how about we listen to Joseph Joffre, who really does care about France, whereas John French doesn't really have the same burden to start out the day as Joseph Joffre does. We are entering into God's territory to fulfill God's work and God's order. And though we may not personally have a burden for it, are we willing to allow God to share his burden with us? Accepting the burden of the Lord as your own. I, I think one of the most important steps we can take in our spiritual life is to realize that when God overtakes this body and calls it his and makes it his home, that these hands are no longer mine, but they're his. And they now don't do what old Eric would do. They do what Jesus would do with hands. These feet are no longer mine. They're the feet of Christ. And they no longer take old Eric where he wants to go, but they take this body known as Eric Ludi where God wants me to go. This mind is no longer the mind of old Eric. It is the mind of Christ. And it thinks different. It reasons different. It processes different. It's been renewed. And as a result, it is able to appropriate the burden of the Lord as something that I desire instead of something that I fear. And this heart is no longer the heart of stone, but it's made soft, the heart of flesh that is made soft by the Holy Spirit so that it can feel what God feels. I remember uh, hearing Jackie Pullinger when she had come back from Hong Kong and was speaking in the United States. She had been there, I don't know, I want to say like 40, maybe 50 years, living in the walled city, and she was around poverty constantly. And she said she was so attuned to poverty that in our culture, people can cover poverty very well. They can be really struggling financially, but still look normal. And she said so that when she comes here, she has this ache at times where she can see someone and they're putting on their best airs. They're, they're wanting to cover up the fact of the struggles they have in their life, but she can see right through it. And she has a burden, but she notices the rest of the American church can just walk right by it and not perceive it because they aren't sensitized the same way she has been after so many years working with that, that very spiritual power. And so, and I was just thinking about, would I want that in my life? It's like, God, yeah, could you give me what she has? Do I really want that? You know, I remember seeing uh, Richard Wormbrandt and hearing him testify, and this is after years of being in solitary confinement. I don't remember what the total was, if it was upwards of, of 20 years uh, total, but a long time that he spent in, some of it was in solitary, some of it was uh, just in prison, but in prison being tortured. And I remember looking at this man and the quality of this man's soul and thinking, I want what this guy has. And then the question came to me, are you willing to go through what that man went through to get it? Like, well, is there another way? Is there a shortcut? You see, those of us in this room, we have all tasted the fine wine of the Spirit of God to a certain degree. We want it. We do. We're attracted to these things. 
But there's a John French dimension of us that's reasoning through the risk to the BEF and why this shouldn't be our battle. This shouldn't be what we waste ourselves on. And I would say, that's God's decision, not ours. You see, we got one life, and that life is not our own. And so what we need to freshly do, and I'm not just saying that this is the one time we do it, I'm just saying this is the action of our soul that we consistently do. That we set our one life before him, and we say, God, what do you want with this one life? Because whatever that burden is that you have, I want to share it. I agree. It's right. And I will, if it's order number six, and that's the burden, I will join in. How do you want to use me? And that's precisely what we need to be bent towards. So let's finish with Jeremiah 20, verse 9. His word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Have you ever had that? You get weary of holding it back. God's working on you. Whether that's to confess a sin, (laughs) whether that's to confess your faith openly in a culture, or maybe to just some worker, a friend that you have, uh, and it's just like it's burning inside of you. That's because God doesn't intend to lose this battle. He desires to use his purchase. And he would really desire you to agree with that. And that's when the freedom and the liberty comes is when we finally just say, okay, all right, Lord. You see, it's not just that he gives us his burdens, but when we go with this lamentation, mourning, and woe, it is not just lamentation, mourning, and woe that we get. We get the presence of God. We get the intimacy with him. When you get the fellowship of his sufferings, you also get the fellowship. And it is a beautiful thing that far outweighs the lamentation, mourning, and woe, the derision, the mockery, and the view of all the abominations, all the things that most of us would prefer not to see. I don't really want to focus on that, God. The reason God is even allowing us to see these things is because he is looking for friends that will share these burdens with him. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Will you watch with me? And that's, in a sense, the invite to all of us right now. You see, he's entering into us into a time of anguish where he's going to sweat as it were great drops of blood. He's like, will you join with me in this? Not that attractive on the natural side. However, if any of you had the opportunity right now to time travel back to the Garden of Gethsemane and you knew that Jesus was saying, would you go through that with me? I mean, you have to admit that that is one of the greatest honors you could ever have is to be invited to share the garden with him. Yeah, it might be a little intimidating, but if you, he promises you, I'll give you grace for it. Oh, well, if I have grace for it, why wouldn't I? In other words, that's the challenge. You've been called to share his garden with him. And yes, it can be heavy, but his grace is sufficient. And this is what makes for the overturning of the enemy at that one key moment when he exposes his flank is that the saints of God are ready to carry the burden of God. Father, we feel very human when we hear messages like this. We feel very much like John French. And the voice of Sir Archibald Murray makes so much sense to us. But Lord, I pray that we would be cheered afresh in our soul by the Holy Spirit. And that we would be reminded that there is no greater privilege than to be your friend in the garden. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would freshly say yes and that we would open up our grip and allow you to do whatsoever you will in our lives today, through us, into tomorrow and the next day. Lord, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen.